I'm Anya Schifrin, and I edited the book Global Muckraking. And um, three of our contributors are in the audience, Katie Redford, Clifford Bob, and Jeff Ballinger. And um, I know it's a horrible day out there, and it's very, very nice of you all to show up in this terrible weather. Um, I, it's, the Global Muckraking was a, a big project that took a couple of years and involved dozens of people. And I was kind of the conductor so of the orchestra. So I thought rather than um, talk to you about it, I'm just going to show you some pictures from the book uh, so you can get a little sense of some of the research that went, it, went into it. And then we'll have a discussion about journalism and impact and advocacy. Um, for those of you who don't know, Global Muckraking is a collection of investigative and campaigning journalism from around the world over the last hundred years. Originally, I thought this would be a book of 15 essays about journalism, and it grew to be 47 pieces of journalism introduced by 40 different historians, scholars, and activists. Um, so you can tell it became an all-consuming labor of love. Um, as well as the contributors, I had research assistants who speak Swahili and Turkish and French and Italian, and we just kind of went for it. So one of the things is um, the book started because I 1600. And I was asked to teach the course by a historian called Richard John. And somewhere along the line, he said to me, well, you're in charge of Africa and India. And I, was, I went in such a panic, how am I going to teach that, that I started looking in libraries all over the world for interesting articles. And I got some of my researchers to do that, too. And we found so many interesting things that I decided I wanted to edit a collection of, of journalism. And I divided it into the sections that matter to journalists in developing countries. So it's different than what you would see in the New York Times. So we have a section on things like slavery and trafficking, or anti-colonialism, or, or environment and natural disasters. Again, just to give you an overview. These are some of the things that I found. This um, is, and I'll just show a few pictures for, to you just to give you a flavor. When I was in the British Library um, in London, one of the things I was curious about was how journalism changed in the post-colonial period in Africa, because of course many of the African leaders really believed in the power of journalism to educate the public, and journalism as a tool. They had a very sort of utilitarian function. So this really, for me, illustrates the concept of development journalism. We, uh, you can see the African, brave African journalist in front of the continent of Africa, wielding the fountain pen, breaking away from his chains, and using it to vanquish the imperialists down at the bottom with the dollar and the pound. Um, this is, again, I just found this in the British Library and you know, got, a, got a picture taken of it. Here's another article from 1961 in Accra. Journalists urged to educate the public, front page article sort of lecturing journalists about what their role should be. Um, this is the Calcutta Gazette, which I read in Calcutta. Um, one of the points I make is that 19th century newspapers were very often like blogs. So they have all kinds of funny letters and random stories. Um, I was very amused in some of these old news, one of these old newspapers, I read an article about how terrible the traffic was on the bridge in Calcutta because of all the horse and carriages. I left the library got in a cab and got stuck on the same bridge. Um, I like to show these pictures because many of our younger students and the younger journalists I'm meeting around the world haven't actually gone into the old collections and don't know what, what they looked like. But you can see there'll be advertisements on the front page, something that's again come back into fashion, announcements of the clipper ship going to China with all the opium. So um, the other point I like to make is that these collections are not being digitized. They are collapsing. Many of them tore and crumbled in my hands as I was reading them. Um, and often when they're digitized, they're not actually searchable. This is um, Amrita Bazar Patrika. We probably won't have time to show pictures of it today, but it was um, an important newspaper in Bengal. Many of you know Amartya Sen's work about the press and famine. They had a role to play also in covering the famine, although not as much as the statesmen. So you're just getting a few highlights here. Um, I'm sure many of you have read King Leopold's Ghost, so I won't even talk about it now, but for me that was sort of a foundational book because of Adam Hochschild's argument that the journalists played a very important role 
and exposing the situation in the Congo. Um, after I read, this is E.D. Morell's newspaper, West African Mail, which talked a lot about the conditions on the, in the rubber gathering. This is from the British Library. After I read that, I began curious to know what other 19th century journalists were doing sort of campaigning journalism. So I kept reading. And I found that, of course, while E.D. Morell and George Washington Williams had been campaigning in the Congo, Benjamin Saldano Roca had been writing about conditions in the rubber plantations on the Amazon. He had a tiny newspaper called La Sanction, which nobody really knew about except for the people living in Iquitos. Here are some of the pictures. Um, and by luck, a couple of American engineers came through the town read the newspaper, found out what was happening, and brought the news back to London. So one of the points we'll be talking about today is how do campaigns go global? What makes a little piece of news or about an atrocity or brutality that people are writing about in a small place in the middle of nowhere, how do they get kind of global interest? That was something I became, started to become interested in as, as we were preparing the book. Again, after that, 1906, probably none of you knew this, there was a boycott of Cadbury chocolate because they didn't know about wh whether the labor conditions in Sao Tome and Principe. It took eight years for the Cadburys to make up their mind. They sent a journalist called Wilbur Burt to investigate. He stopped in Portugal, learned Portuguese, went to Sao Tome and Principe. According to Catherine Higgs, he was such an idiot that he reported back from Sao Tome and Principe and said, everything's great. The kids have huge stomachs. They're all fine. Henry Nevison, the American journalist who'd written about slavery for Harper's, went and did his own investigation and wrote a series of reports. There were editorials in the London Standard. The Cadbury sued. Um, eventually, uh, they decided they needed to clean up their act. I'm oversimplifying, but I want to make sure that you all see the resemblances between some of the debates we've had over Nike, which Jeff Ballinger will talk about, and Foxconn, and uh, some of the other great kind of labor stories. I'll end it here, but... Um, I, I, this, this PowerPoint, I'll stop, but I have sort of 25 pictures of different journalists and causes, and I think that you get my sort of main point, which is that the pieces in this book raise a lot of questions about the role of journalism, the role of advocacy, cam campaigns, and um, I'm really happy today because Instead, I've been giving talks about this book all over the world, especially anywhere where journalism is having a hard time. People are interested. So I gave you know, four talks in Malaysia, two talks in Turkey. I just got back last night from Budapest and Johannesburg. And um, what's, I've been meeting a lot of young journalists, investigative journalists all over the place. And what's great about this panel is there's no journalists on it. We have really people that are more interested in, we've got two, a, a camp, two campaigners, I guess is how I would describe you, and a professor who's written a lot about ideas and campaigning and, and how ideas spread. So um, shall we all start our conversation? Thank you very much for coming here on this horrible day. I don't know how to turn this off. Whatever. I'll just leave that, I guess. I'm supposed to sit here and you. Yes, I think that's right. I'm supposed to Velcro this on. OK. Thank you, Jeff. Good. Thank you. So uh, once again, Katie Redford, Clifford Bob, and Jeff Ballinger. And um, I think that I would, I'd like to start by saying that one of the things that surprised me as we were doing the research for the book was I had always thought, I hadn't understood how, how connected advocates were to journalists for many, of the big st for many of the big stories. There's a kind of narrative that we hear a lot, which is, oh, nowadays it's so terrible. The New York Times has cut back their spending on investigative journalism. And if you want to know what's really going on with, say, Philippine workers in the Middle East, you have to read a Human Rights Watch report or a report from Amnesty International or a report from Earth Rights. And what surprised me, and maybe it shouldn't have, as we were researching the book, was that historically, many of the important stories that I thought of as just stories, there was involvement in some way from an advocate or from a campaigner. Like, the Cadbury's helping support newspapers during their fight against uh, slavery. Um, and I thought that this would be really a good point um, to begin with Jeff Ballinger, because you did such a good job in Indonesia and in Vietnam of getting the press to focus.
on labor conditions, especially in the, in the Nike subcontractor. So I thought maybe you could talk a little bit about that relationship. It's hard to talk just a little about it, okay, but I will try. Um, I think a little background would be helpful, a background, my personal background, that is having done seven, eight years of uh, labor organizing and political work in trade unions and then going to law school. And I was very interested in international law and uh, human rights. And so I took the international law and the human rights courses. And then I said to myself, oh my god, there's no place to adjudicate these cases. I mean, you have laws. But uh, I spent the last year of uh, law school in media studies, media law. And uh, uh, because I knew the only place to adjudicate would be on the streets and you know the court of public opinion. So uh, that's what. I took with me when I went abroad, along with a couple of uh, subscription, um, many subscription magazine subscriptions, but among them, the Columbia Journalism Review mm -hmm. and the uh, Index on Censorship. So I, I kind of knew when I was leaving in the mid 80s that uh, the only thing that would help the people that I was going to be interacting with would be getting their stories a wider audience. So uh, uh, that's what motivated me, and it didn't take me much time in Indonesia to discover what the big story would be. Uh, uh, there was a team of 10 Indonesian doctors who'd followed these 20 or 30 Indonesian women, minimum wage working women. Uh, uh, these doctors did blood samples and stool samples and you know, monitored their health, and 88 were anemic. 88% were anemic of these uh, 30 women operating, you know, earning just the minimum wage. So I knew that this was the story. There was a question of how to get the story out. So uh, uh, there was uh, a time when my boss visited uh, Indonesia, and you know, I told him this uh, awful minimum wage, 86 cents a day, was only 60% of the minimum physical need for a single adult, not for a family, but for a single adult, admitted by the US, uh, by the Indonesian government. And they had just had this flood of foreign investment from China, and from uh, Taiwan and South Korea because democracy in the late 80s had come to both countries. And so all these low wage industries migrated to China and Indonesia. So the Indonesian government was kind of off balance. They didn't know kind of how to handle this, whether they should even have a minimum wage. You know, there were, you know, there, there was not a lot of, uh, there had not been a lot of agitation up till then. So uh, one of the first things I read in the local press I had translated from Indonesian was that a strike at a Reebok producing factory where the bosses had tried to cut the wage from 86 cents a day to 84 cents a day. To say, you know, trying to, trying to find rock bottom, I guess. Uh, that's the only explanation. Uh, and I, I was very pleasantly surprised that this was being reported in the newspapers, and not just the elite newspapers, but in the tabloids that the workers read. So with, complete with pictures of workers in the streets. And I thought, wow, this is... You know, in, in a Suharto run, you know, pretty tightly controlled atmosphere, this was, this was very interesting. And how could we, you know, gin it up, basically, was, uh, was, was my um, uh, dilemma, uh, problem. Uh, and my boss visited and he said, well, why don't you monitor compliance with the minimum wage? Why don't you see who's paying and maybe people aren't even paying the minimum wage? And so we did. We, we got about... $5,000 from local AID funds uh, and uh, did this survey and you know the, the press reported all of our findings that yeah. half of the factories weren't paying the minimum wage even this uh, very inadequate minimum wage. So uh, you know I really felt buoyed up by this that uh, it seemed like the government wanted to punish these foreign investors mm -hmm. as well. And I have to uh, take a step back here and explain it wasn't you know, Nike wasn't running these factories. They were the South Korean and Taiwanese contractors, supplier factories. Most of you in this room would know that. But uh, that was a conceptual hurdle I had to get over with American readers because they thought, ah, oh, you know, they saw that oh, Nike's not going to cheat, you know, workers, uh, you know. And, and, and that's what I thought, too. I joined the softball team not long after arriving in Jakarta. And three of the guys on my team were from Nike. And one of them said, you know, How, what are you doing here? And I said, well, the American unions have a small office to help the Indonesian workers. And he narrowed his eyes. He said, I'm your worst nightmare. <laughs> and I thought it was the usual business labor banter you get into when you identify yourself as a union person. So I didn't think much of it until we did this minimum wage survey and these shoe factories showed up as 
big abusers, big cheaters. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, of course, I paid pretty close attention to those factories for my remaining couple of years in Indonesia. And then, after leaving, stayed in touch with you know, this burgeoning movement, these workers who had uh, you know, started strikes, and some of them were fired, and some of them were, you know, they, it was not like Central America. They didn't murder trade unionists. They didn't disappear them. They tried to marginalize them. They, uh, they had the Asian way of uh, dealing with the problem. But, uh, you know, I made it my business to narrowly focus on these 15 or 20 big shoe producing and, and Nike producing factories because I figured if you, if you tried to take on child labor across Asia, well, good luck. You know, you're not going to have much success, but if you narrowly focus on one set of factories, one brand in one country, then, you know, there's a good likelihood that you will know more about those factories than that company does. And that's exactly what happened over the, you know, late 80s, early 90s. I was sending out packets of information mm -hmm. to human rights groups and journalists, you know, maybe, mm -hmm. you know, 10, 15 a month for, uh, for five or six years. And, uh, you know, a few stories got in uh, American press, a few wire stories, but not much until, you know, Kathy Lee Gifford was dragged out on the world stage. You know, she was this hostess on a, a, yeah. a, a television program in the morning. And, and uh, Charlie Kernigan, one of the old uh, uh, most effective sweatshop, uh, anti-sweatshop uh, organizers, had found some of her uh, garments being produced in El Salvador or Honduras, I'm not sure which, but it's child labor or something. He confronted her and she, you know, made this, because she had this podium, right? I mean, she had more, five, five mornings a week on television and she, you know, called him a liar and uh, uh, long story short, you know, she got hammered and uh, he had, you know, he had the goods on her and, and she eventually came around to the White House and said, you guys ought to be doing something about this, you know, to Bill Clinton and Robert Reich and, uh, and so, the, what ultimately came of that, the corporate social responsibility pledges and, and social auditing that went on in the factories was not very satisfying. In fact, it was a smokescreen. But I must say that the agitation in Indonesia and tying Nike to that and, and making them the mm, focus mm. really helped those workers in Indonesia. And not only the ones in the shoe factories, but all minimum wage workers' wage was increased from 86 cents a day to like $2.47, which is triple real wages, you know, in a five, six year period because of this, largely because of this uh, uh, news, uh, this uh, avalanche of news. I mean, I, I uh, you know, I was really uh, gratified that uh, American, you know, papers, you know, responded to this story the way they did. And uh, uh, so it was, uh, it, it was that group of workers and, and their, the, that cohort in Indonesia, the low-wage workers who benefited uh, a lot. And uh, uh, un uh, unfortunately, the anti-sweatshop movement sort of stalled because you know, people said, oh, it's being taken care of. There are you know, these uh, codes of conduct in place. And uh, you know, so, so that wasn't very satisfying. In fact, that was uh, uh, something that, uh, that, that still needs to be addressed because there are still these, uh, uh, these abuses going on. And uh, I, I think I'll leave it there and maybe pick up some other things in, uh, in the question and answer. But two takeaways I, I think I have to, uh, to leave you with is referring back to, you know, not thinking there was any place to adjudicate. Well, I, mm -hmm. I talked a lot in the early 2000s at business schools. And uh, I went to the Tuck School at Dartmouth maybe uh, three years, four years in a row and talked to... Uh, uh, almost a dozen classes, different classes on business ethics. And with hundreds of students, and these were doing international business, these students were doing international business. Um, not once did the ILO come up. Not once did somebody mention, isn't there an international labor organization? Isn't it? And then their budget is something like $280 million, million a year. It shows you how insignificant they are and, and how there really isn't any place to adjudicate. There isn't any you know, advocate. Uh, for these uh, workers uh, who are still, you know, being uh, abused and, uh, uh, and mistreated. So uh, I really think that uh, the other takeaway I'll leave you with is uh, if you have the data, you know, you can do some good work. Like only two cases I'll mention. The, you, how many here have heard about uh, Walmart bribing people in Mexico and, and China? Oh, good number. Pulitzer Prize winning story. Yeah. 
But a couple of pension funds, a couple of union pension funds said, we're going to do a civil uh, uh, action against Walmart for doing this. And Walmart tried to you know, pull an end run by spending $430 million on compliance you know, lawyering up, you know, and saying, trying to convince the courts that they were serious about getting ahead of this bribery question, the courts in Delaware said, uh uh, we're going to make you give all those documents to these uh, lawyers for these two pension funds. And, uh, you know, that's huge. The only the last thing was the Harvard uh, Institute for International Development and the Russian privatization. There was a story, an institutional investor, this guy doggedly pursued, you know, Jeff Sachs and uh, um, a guy. He's Andre Schleifer. Schleifer. Schleifer's a tenured professor still at Harvard. And, and that mm -hmm. forced Harvard to give back $25 million to USAID mm -hmm. because they saw a lot of dirty dealing and, you know, these, um, you know, the oligarchs were the ones benefiting from the privatization in Russia. So. I'll leave it there, uh, and uh, hopefully we'll get to some questions you might have about Actually, Jeff, I have some questions. Oh, Sorry. Sir. I mean, there were millions of things I wanted to ask you, but we have um, you know, not as much time as I could spend all day on this. But I did want to ask you, one thing that people are always saying to me is, could, we, could the successes of the Nike campaign, would that be possible today? Mm. And can, in the sort of intent, you know, fragmented world, Mm. Um, that we live in with so many different investigative reporting yeah. websites, so many little stories. Um, and what about boycotts? Is that even possible now? Or was this really... Or does it's not so generous. It's tactics? pretty pretty close because of, of the breadth, uh, I mean the, um, mm. the length of the campaign. This is like uh, 12 years invested in, in this nice. before we got to, you know, the, the, the Nouveau. But, uh, Two things, two cases I'll give you that give me hope is that if you're persistent, you still can get restitution for workers. There are two cases. They're mm -hmm. very different cases. One was the United Students Against Sweatshops. Uh, one guy just got determined to fight for these workers in Honduras that, again, Nike had mm -hmm. cheated, a Nike producing factory, and he pursued it just, you know, by bringing workers from Honduras, taking them around the country, uh, organizing in, in very innovative and uh, uh, aggressive ways. And he won that restitution case. For these. The workers got millions in, uh, in compensation. Another one, a very different case, some Vietnamese group in uh, uh, Australia, expat Vietnamese in Australia, learned about a factory in Malaysia producing T-shirts for Nike and all full of Bangladeshis and Vietnamese who were horribly treated. And they got a film crew from Australia to go there, film it. And that film alone, I mean, that was almost all it needed to be done for these workers to get millions in restitution. So uh, I've been disappointed that there haven't been more of these, you know, uh, these types of uh, efforts because God knows there are, there are many opportunities to do it. On the boycott, I'll tell you, I worked on the last successful boycott in America with the uh, clothing and textile workers. You know, that, they were back, back when they were the amalgamated clothing workers of America in the, in the 70s. And uh, we you know, hurt this company. Willie Farah was the guy who put all of his uh, uh, pants factories on the uh, Texas-Mexico border in the 70s and hurt him. But that was the last boycott that was, uh, that was successful mm -hmm. in, in the States. And I, I, I see the Nike campaign as an, an implied boycott because their sales fell in America, 96, 97, 98, all the way up to 99, when they were spending billions in advertising. Mm -hmm. you know, so their US sales suffered because of you know, the, the hammering they were getting in the press. So you know, I never called it a boycott. Nobody ever you know, presented it that way. But mm -hmm. people put two and two together. If you're saying this company is not you know, worthy of your uh, trust, then you know, they, they react against it. Really interesting. I mean, in a way, you're also reminding me a bit of this wonderful series in Bloomberg about the labor conditions in the iPhone 5 factory in Malaysia. Because I don't know that anybody stopped buying, you know, Apple products. It's very tough to pry Apple aficionados away from their gadgets. I, I mean, that's, that, right. that's, a, that's a difficult yeah. one. I have, a, I have a plan we can discuss okay. later, curious, but yeah. uh, uh, it wouldn't yeah. involve actually asking people not to buy the thing. 
but right. to connect those workers with the consumers. Yeah. We can do that now with the, uh, the, the Weibo, is it the Twitter mm -hmm. of China? Mm -hmm. and, uh, right, Weibo. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, think, I think there's a way to, to uh, address it, and yeah. uh, I'd very much like to yeah. explore that. I mean, I think one of the questions that really, one of the things that's interesting about the book is there's some examples of journalism that really made a difference, and then there's plenty of examples of journalism that didn't make any difference. For example, Gareth Jones' coverage of the Ukrainian famine in 1932. He wrote 30 stories about it, over, published 30 stories over two weeks, and you know, nothing happened because there were, the geopolitical situation was such that no one was going to send any food aid. Whereas in 1943, when the statesmen showed photographs of starving children in Calcutta, the British were ashamed. So I mean, clearly there's lots of things that um, you have to have in place for journalism to make a difference, right? One is at your point that it has to be sustained over a long period of time. One terrible expose usually doesn't affect anybody. Second is you have to be writing or exposing um, organizations or entities that actually care about their reputation. So Stalin didn't necessarily <laughs> care if people in the US thought people were starving in Ukraine. And then clearly there's a distinction between a domestic audience and an international audience. Um, I lived in Vietnam for several years, and the, the Vietnamese cared a lot about what the Vietnamese, the Vietnamese government and the party cared about what Vietnamese people thought, but they didn't necessarily care that much about what foreigners thought. Um, so I, I know you're going to say something. So um, do you want to do you want to wait? No, I just I say the Vietnam case response? was so interesting because yeah. we gave to Roberta Baskin of CBS, the mm. consumer reporter who did the Indonesia yeah. Nike story. We gave her translations from the in, from the Vietnamese labor newspaper that described oh, these workers sure. getting slapped around, and she, she was the, she was on a plane within a couple of weeks. I mean, it was just yeah. that you know, and, and that was definitely a message from that government to those companies saying. You know, you know, the people around those factories will burn the damn factories down unless yes. you deal with this. Yeah, well, um, I mean, sorry. Once now we're on Vietnam, I used to live there and I, used to, I did some labor stories. So now I really could go all afternoon because obviously Vietnamese government was in a way very divided, right? Because there were union elements that cared about working conditions. Absolutely. And then there were people that just wanted to attract foreign investment mm. and would tell Vietnamese journalists and foreign reporters, you know, don't cover this. Um, so I think playing to kind of domestic uh, constituencies also matters a lot. But I think what I want to talk to Cliff about, was, well, you've got two great books um, on the subject, one about the global right wing, and then the one that really kind of inspired me for, for this book, in which you talk about how foreign causes get international attention. So I'd love to hear you talk about that a bit, too. Sure. Yeah. Thanks very much. Um, oh, yeah. Thank you. My, um, interest in this whole area is, I guess, mostly academic rather than activist. Mm -hmm. But um, I am very concerned about the kind of issues that Jeff's talking about. And my interest started really when I read back in the mid-1990s about the execution of Ken Sarawiwa, a, a, an activist from Nigeria from a small ethnic group, the Agoni, um, who was executed by the government of Sunni, uh, uh, sorry, of the military government of uh, Nigeria in 1995. And um, in reading about that case, I first understood him as an ethnic uh, activist trying to uh, get more rights for his small group, trying to get uh, more um, power for his group within the Nigerian state. Um, and I became very interested in, in why that group in particular did kind of rise to the top of the media agenda, at least for a short period of time in the 1990s, and why I even came to know of his group and of him, um, when in particular he was just one of many other ethnic activists among minor minority groups in Nigeria trying to get international attention and support for his cause. So um, I got very interested in uh, trying to come up with kind of a theory, if you will, about how some cases like his get to the top of the international agenda and others don't. And um, a big part of it, I found, was the role of the media, definitely. Um, but I actually um, tried to take it back a step and look at the way in which local activists first try to uh, 
promote their causes through any mechanism at all, whether domestic or international. And a lot of times, these local activists will find they're up against a total stone wall within their own societies. Certainly, Sarah Wewa did early, in the early 1990s. Uh, again, a military dictatorship that didn't really pay any attention to his demands for his group. Um, and so he became a key actor in trying to get international attention and support for his group. Um, he traveled overseas. He had the resources to do that. He was a fairly wealthy man, and um, um, uh, actually a member of the media in, in Nigeria. And he tried to get the attention of non-governmental organizations in Europe and in the United States to his pro the problems that his, his group was facing. Um, initially, he didn't succeed particularly well. Uh, a number of groups in the environmental field and the human rights field basically didn't feel that his, the problems his group was facing, which he, he did frame as uh, an inability to get the uh, interests of this minority group recognized within Nigeria, uh, they didn't see those as, as important enough uh, or relevant enough to their causes. Um, and uh, he, in, in frustration, he began to write um, pieces in the Nigerian media and tried also to get into the international media. The piece that I have in the book that he wrote in 1990 um, basically says, you know, if the Nigerian government doesn't do something to try to deal with the demands of these minority groups, doesn't continue to, doesn't stop repressing, there's going to be a war in the Niger Delta. Um, unfortunately, that really wasn't uh, listened to by the government, mm -hmm. and it wasn't picked up by the international mm -hmm. press at all. Um, and you know, over a decade later, there was very severe bloodshed in the Niger Delta, which in some ways continues to today. Um, certainly in the late 90s, early 2000s, it was, it was quite severe. Um, but anyway, he, he did ultimately succeed in getting at least some attention for his uh, cause. Uh, and, and the way he did this, I think, was quite interesting and says something about how the press sometimes does get involved and sometimes doesn't get involved in, in particular issues. Um, as I said, his main focus initially was on the ethnic rights and repression of uh, the, the minority group in Nigeria. Uh, but to get the international press interested in the problems that the group was facing, he had to really reframe it to make it more interesting and appealing to international audiences. And he did that by focusing on the role of Shell Oil Company in the Niger Delta. Uh, Shell had actually been present there for decades, and uh, its operations were not up to any types of international environmental standards. There were many accidents, many um, oil spills. They also often turned to the Nigerian military or police forces to um, force um, workers to do things they might other, not otherwise do or to, to repress strikes. Um, and so um, Sarah Wewa, in I, what I call basically a kind of a marketing campaign, reframed those the, the issues that had originally spurred Begoni activism, namely minority rights within Nigeria, reframed them as the repression of this indigenous group by a multinational corporation, a corporation which and kind of reminiscent of Nike, you know, sells directly to consumers in the developed world. And um, therefore, there could be a relatively direct connection made between what was happening to the Agoni people in the Niger Delta uh, and what you and I might buy at a gas station on the street in, in Europe or in the United States. And when he did make that connection, and uh, began talking about it to various non-governmental organizations, especially environmental ones like Greenpeace and uh, Friends of the Earth, um, it started to get some real traction in the international media. And um, for me, what was interesting was that he was able to, in a sense, um, shift the, the main focus of what the Agonis were concerned about locally to something somewhat different at the international level. I mean, environmental problems were real for the people of the Agoni, uh, of the Niger Delta, but they were the ones that really um, took off internationally, whereas the minority rights uh, problems, the, the, the difficulty they had getting representation at the international level, really didn't, at the national, really didn't pick up internationally uh, among the, the, the media. So for me, this suggested that 
a, a major uh, problem that a lot of local activists face is how to make their um, very pressing national or domestic demands uh, appealing to international audiences. Um, and this kind of reframing process that he uh, did, and I, I found a lot of documents showing the, ch the shift in the way he portrayed this cause uh, over time, was, was really quite key. Mm -hmm. The other thing that I think is interesting and important, and also kind of relates to, to Jeff's uh, earlier point and some of what Anya was saying, is that um, you know, it's not every activist that can necessarily do this. Uh, as I mentioned, Sarah Wewo was um, a wealthy man and uh, had a lot of international contacts. He spoke English fluently. Uh, and uh, he was a very articulate writer. Uh, so he was able to do uh, this kind of international marketing in a way that a lot of local groups, particularly the ones I compared his group to in the Niger Delta, weren't able to do. In addition, um, he faced a very repressive state, which did not uh, respond to the demands domestically but which was kind of seen as a pariah state, and of course a very well-known state as being the largest uh, by population in, in uh, Africa. Um, so uh, I think the, the uh, enemy that they were trying to, that they were facing in that case was one that could also attract international attention, both of course Shell, but also the uh, Nigerian state at that point under this uh, military dictatorship. So all of that, um, in the book th that I wrote, The Marketing of Rebellion, I try to put into a broader theoretical framework to try to understand why in some cases um, small scale social movements or insurgent groups can gain international attention, whereas others that look very similar, operating at the same time against the same opponents, might not be able to gain so much attention. And of course, um, unsurprisingly, I have a little connection, which is that I was covering Shell from Amsterdam during the 90s. And I, I don't think you can um, overestimate what a huge story that was. You know, I remember that sh annual shareholders meetings when people call for a moment of silence and how Shell, after Ken Sarawi was executed by the government and the newspaper coverage. You remember in the days leading up to his execution and the days afterwards. It was really a kind of a tremendous um, ph media phenomenon in, in, the, in the way that Nike was too. Um, this is such an interesting conversation because it's turning in so much into kind of tactics about advocacy. I know also you've made the point in your book that the Dalai Lama and Aung San Suu Kyi sort of fit into your theoretical framework because they're also very personable, speak English, or have, have a lot of international contacts. Um, I don't know if you want to comment on that or if I should weigh in with you. Well, I would just here. say, Go ahead. Um, mm. yeah, I mean, I think that especially with regard to the Tibetans and the Dalai Lama. Um, in looking at their case, uh, which in some ways is successful because they are very well, well known internationally, uh, it, the flip side is that they really haven't achieved a lot of what they might want uh, within China. Uh, even though they have a major international following, it's a, a situation where they're facing a very difficult and powerful um, foe. Mm -hmm. and so it, it, to, to um, focus just on the international media attention can, I think, sometimes divert uh, attention from the fact that they may not actually be achieving all that they, they, they really want on the ground. The, but uh, it, it, from the more sort of academic standpoint, it's interesting to note that other uh, minority groups in China, like the Uyghurs, mm -hmm. uh, a Muslim group in Western China, facing almost exactly the same kind of repression that the Tibetans have, have not even gotten that high level of international media attention. Or mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're certainly not as well known as the, uh, the Tibetans among the foreign populations, for what that's worth, I guess I'd say. And, and that, th that connection also, that, that uh, comparison also uh, helps bring out another aspect of this. I think um, the identity of the group that's seeking international attention can make a difference. I think that Tibetans, uh, first of all, having the Dalai Lama as a, their leader, as you mentioned, with the various charismatic and articulate aspects that he, he, characteristics that he clearly has makes a difference. But I think the fact that the Uyghurs are a Muslim group, mm -hmm. that they've been heavily tarred as terrorists by the Chinese mm -hmm. government, even though I don't think that's really 
uh, correct in a lot of ways. But uh, to, the extent, to the extent that's happened, uh, and it fits into this broader global narrative about terrorism, uh, that has, I think, kept their cause from rising as significantly as the Tibetans. Absolutely, and I think there's loads of data about you know, how much money people give when there's a flood in Pakistan versus a flood in somewhere that's you know, more appealing or more, more friendly to us. You also, I mean, it also touches on the point that Jeff made, which is that journalism or campaigns can, can have an effect when it's something small and easy to fix, whereas something huge like re, you know, redrawing boundaries um, that's obviously going to be a much more difficult cause. Right. Um, so I think this brings us very nicely in many ways to the whole point about Burma, Myanmar, and, and UNICAL um, on several levels. One of the things I tried to do in the book as much as possible was include journalism from developing countries written by reporters in those countries. Um, and I, and I want to also just mention in the book that some of the pieces are more kind of classical campaigning journalism, but a lot of it is sort of good old fashioned investigative journalism. And if we were in a room with more, it had more journalists on the panel, we'd probably talk a little bit more about the journalism and the techniques and the reporting. Um, but I think it's nice to keep going with this sort of activist question. So, so one, the piece that you introduced, Katie, is interesting on a few levels. One is that because Burmese journalists were not able to write about these problems, a foreign, foreign journalist from the Los Angeles Times were the ones who, who exposed the story. So I'd, I'd love to hear your take on that. Then there's, of course, what, something you've both sort of touched on, which is the interplay between foreign coverage and domestic coverage and domestic impact, right? Sometimes when the local press can't cover it, the foreign press can, it can get picked up locally, or, or at least there's an international sort of embarrassment that can happen and, and, and push governments. And then the third thing is, because you're involved in this lawsuit, that went on for years. I'm happy that you'll be able to talk a little bit about legal questions. And of course, oil and mining are a big theme of the book because there's so much, there's so many human rights, there's so much journalism about it all over the world with sort of varying degrees. So there's some thoughts for you. Thank you so much, Katie. Sure. This is the first time we're actually on a panel together out of <laughs> all the book events. I'm really, really glad to be in the same room as you. Yeah, me too. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, so, I know this was kind of random, like who's in DC, but you just set me Perfect. up so well <laughs> for what I want to say because, um, because Earth Rights International, the organization that, that I co-founded and that I still run, was really established um, in 1995 to deal with the two things that you both just precisely spoke about. Um, first, I was a third year law student in the 90s when it was true that, okay, a corporation goes overseas, commits or is complicit in human rights abuses, and there's nowhere to adjudicate it. They're above the law. In this age of globalization, there was no globalization of justice, and the law was very clear that um, a company was subject to the law of the land in which it operated. So if it was operating in Burma, great, bring them to court in Burma. If it was operating in Nigeria, great, bring them to court in Nigeria. And in those two cases, obviously, military dictatorship very repressive. It would have been life-threatening for people to try to pursue their cases. And so um, I started Earth Rights with the goal of changing that. And for sure, um, the, the imprisonment, the torture, and eventually the execution of Ken Sarawiwa and the Agoni Nine were a watershed moment um, in terms of the complicity of oil companies and corporations in general. Um, in human rights abuses, and also the connection between environmental harm and human rights abuses. Um, the Ken Sarawiwa campaign was, was the first time in which global human rights organizations and global environmental campaigners came together on one shared campaign. He was a prisoner of conscience for Amnesty International, Greenpeace, Sierra Club, the biggest organizations in the world came together to campaign to save his life. And um, Earth Rights eventually represented his family um, and others in a lawsuit against Shell um, demanding accountability for their role in his torture and execution. So these two um, sort of problems of lack of accountability and um, 
no court to go, as well as the interconnection between human rights abuses and environmental harms are what inspired me and others to start Earth Rights um, back in 1995. And um, the first place that we went was, as Anya mentioned, to, to Burma, because one of our co-founders was from Burma. Um, and, you know, brutal human rights abuses, slave labor, torture, rape on wide, widespread scales. Um, by the military for, for dec decades, but in the 90s, um, corporations started getting involved and companies started going into Burma in search of these valuable resources, oil, gas, mines, um, gems, um, and literally doing deals with the Burmese military, signing contracts, and this was the subject of um, the piece that I set up in the book about Unical, um, which has since been taken over by Chevron, um, but at that point a, a U.S. Um, multinational oil company based in Los Angeles um, that had gone into a contractual relationship with the Burmese army, which is notorious for human rights abuses, to um, construct a pipeline across Burma to carry natural gas from Burma into Thailand. Um, and as part of the contract, the Burmese army was actually hired by the oil company to provide security for the pipeline. Um, and <laughs> um, in fulfilling its contractual responsibilities, the Burmese army did what it always did in its security operations. It um, forced villagers out of their homes. It enslaved villagers to first build the military barracks um, that would house the soldiers sent to provide security for the oil companies and its pipeline. Um, and then later forced villagers to build the infrastructure for the pipeline, helicopter landing pads, pipeline roads, um, bridges, ports, all kinds of infrastructure that, that villagers from the region were forced, um, often at gunpoint, to do for the army who was hired by, by the oil company. Um, and so as a young idealist, idealistic lawyer who, yes, went to law school and was told that, no, you can't do anything about this because it happened in Burma, I also remembered what I had learned, <laughs> one of the few things I remember from law school, that the law is a dynamic and ever-changing thing, and you can always change the law if you have the right facts. And, we as a human rights organization with people on the ground, human rights investigators who were able to go into the pipeline region and talk to villagers, talk to victims and survivors, and talk to witnesses of the abuses um, on this pipeline, we had the evidence. We had a clear case for complicity with this oil company um, in the human rights abuses. And so we filed a case in 1996 against UNICAL for its complicity in human rights abuses in Burma. And um, it became the first case ever in which a company was sued in the United States for human rights abuses that happened overseas. And that was in 1996, the year after um, Ken Sarawiwa was executed. And immediately the Agoni came to us and said, if you can sue UNICAL for abuses in Burma, can you sue Shell for their complicity in, in the executions? And we said, Let's try, and we did. Um, and so these cases went on for, the Unical case went on for 10 years, the, the Shell case went on for 13 years, they dragged through the courts, and um, eventually both cases um, were successfully settled on behalf of, the, of our clients and these companies who fought tooth and nail to ever avoid um, paying a dime to our clients eventually paid a lot more than that. And, yeah, we're, we're great lawyers, but I will absolutely say that it was the journalism um, that forced these companies to come to the table um, on the eve of trial because there had been so many stories, such bad publicity, such bad press, and they were terrified at the prospect of journalists, um, front page newspaper, you know, Unical, guilty of you know, human rights abuses, Shell guilty of torture and executions. Um, and that was what really kept the campaigning on the ground internationally going, was the, the media and the journalism every step of the way. Um, the piece that, that 
is in the book, um, as, as you said, was by Lisa Garian, who was a journalist from the LA Times and Unical, headquartered in Los Angeles. So, you know, we also sued their president and their CEO, who lived in Los Angeles, went to church in Los Angeles, were upstanding members of the community in Los Angeles. Um, and were hoping that they could sort of avoid any scrutiny because all of the stuff was happening in Burma or in this highly technical lawsuit that nobody really understood. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, the interesting thing was, as Anya said, not only were journalists in Burma unable to document the story and report on it, in fact, the only people that could report on it were foreign journalists because the pipeline region was so highly militarized mm -hmm. that the only journalists that were allowed to go in were those that were escorted and arranged by the oil companies. So the companies took a couple of um, <laughs> very well staged junkets, um, to press junkets to the pipeline region and they showed them pig farms and chicken farms and all the development work that they were doing on the ground and how they were bringing these poor Burmese people out of poverty. Um, and so the LA Times actually sent Lisa on one of these junkets, but then let her have days on the front end and on the back end to talk to real people who had fled from the region, our clients and others, um, to hear what the real story was on the ground. Um, and so, you know, and <laughs> doing that kind of reporting in, in um, a region that, you know, you can have a rainstorm and the roads washed out and then the people that you're supposed to be meeting don't show up, which is exactly what happened to her. She had to spend a lot of time and she actually had to take two trips because the first time she came, um, our clients couldn't cross the border into Thailand. And um, she still says today that, you know, there's no way that newspapers would budget for that anymore, would give a journalist 10 days to cover one story and then go back when it didn't work out so well the first time due to, you know, um, borders closing or roads being washed out. Um, but that story appeared, it was a front page LA Times story two days in a row right on their home turf where this oil company that was trying to hide behind, oh, that's all happening in Burma, or that's all happening in the court, um, they had nowhere to hide anymore. And our clients who were interviewed and whose words appeared on the front page were given a voice, were given a platform to tell their story um, for the first time. And after that story came out, they were like, we don't care what happens in this case we had the chance to speak truth to power, to tell our story and to have people listen. And that was the justice that they had really cared about all along. Um, and then we won the case anyway, so that was great. Um, and I do think that the, that, that the media, I mean, we then brought that media to shareholder meetings, to all kinds of campaigners were using those stories to pressure the company. It's so interesting. I mean, that question of documentation and evidence comes over and over again in the book. I mean, literally in Congo in the 1890s, the journalists had a problem finding out what was happening um, in the, with the rubber gathering because the boats were all controlled by the, by the Congolese. Um, and they relied on missionary accounts. I tried to do once a journalism training in Indonesia in one of the mining areas. And we were told by the Indonesian government, you can't go. And we said, what? And they said, yeah, the mining, the mining company controls that. Mm -hmm. um, and we spoke to the foreign minister and said, of Indonesia, can't you do something? They said, no, sorry. Um, just last week in Johannesburg, I was giving a course on covering oil and mining and websites you can use. Because obviously the hope is that the internet, the big data will make a difference. Because again, so many African journalists can't get to the places where the extraction is happening. And I just said, you know, who in the room has been to an oil or mining area and has been taken by a big company? And almost every, like two thirds of the people in the room raised their hand. I mean, you know, I wonder whether, to, to whether the internet is really gonna make a huge difference because in theory now people can get information from the locals about, about what's happening. The, the hope is obviously that it will, but I, it's so interesting that Burma, I mean, 
again, this is such a perennial problem that it seems like it, it shouldn't be really. I don't know, um, I know we're finishing at quarter to two, so I don't know if Jeff or Cliff or Kay, do you want to comment on each other's remarks before we open to the floor? Did anything spark something you'd like to? I, I was just thinking as you were um, talking about the control of information yeah. by corporations, which mm -hmm. I think is a very critical uh, factor, it's, and not really just by corporations, but That's also right. by governments and mm -hmm. their efforts to throw kind of blanket uh, blankets over a lot of potential problems. Mm -hmm. um, and um, the examples you gave are, are interesting ones. Um, I, you know, have to, I'm just reminded of. I our own government's secrecy about so much that's going on with the war on terror mm -hmm. and the difficulties independent journalists have of doing reporting outside of being embedded in the military, which basically means you're being fed what they want you to see. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I just think that um, although we're t we've talked mostly about you know problems over there in the developing world, we could see similar types of problems right here. And um, that, um, also sort of brings to mind an article I read today uh, about what's happening in Mexico in the wake of the killings of these 43 students, um, which has become a huge story in Mexico and of course is directly related to the drug wars uh, and our war on drugs in the US, um, but has not really gotten a lot of attention in the United States despite that easy connection that could be made. Um, and in some ways the responsibility of the U.S., um, our, our policies for what is, is going on there. So um, I guess my, my point is that you know, we, we have our own problems with controlling information within our own government. Mm -hmm. And uh, on the other hand, maybe even in a place where it's probably relatively easy to get information out, it doesn't necessarily mean that um, a target government or those who are responsible are going to going to actually respond. That's right. I spent the weekend reading Joel Simon's new book, which I can't recommend highly enough. He's the head of the Committee to Protect Journalists, and it's called The New Global Censorship. And he talks a lot about that and about surveillance and, and what's happened. Um, if chapter, yeah, chapters five and six on web wars mm -hmm. <laughs> really, really cover that. Um, anyway, s audience, I'm sure people have questions. So let me, yes, in the red shirt. Hello, uh, my name, can you hear me? I'm sure you can. My name is Adama Odefa. I'm Nigerian, I'm in the media, and I was at home when the Ken Sarawiwa thing happened. So it's interesting that your version eliminates a bit of the story and a very important bit of it. So what happened was that, what got um, international attention wasn't that Ken Sarawiwa retold his story um, that uh, Shell was killing the environment, what got international attention was that Ken Sarawiwa mobilized the youth in Ogoni Kingdom and they attacked and brutally murdered the elders of the kingdom. Now the military dictatorship, which was mad and we all hated them, uh, pounced on him and his execution was eventually a reprisal killing, which is wrong. So what got the media attention at that time, it became so hyper, was that he, he didn't have a trial. They just constituted a kangaroo court he didn't answer, he didn't say one word in his trial, and they went ahead and hung him. So everybody was appalled by that. But he wasn't uh, entirely a saint. He was also a villain. Those elders had families, and they were brutally murdered on the streets of the town and displayed publicly, and then the military attacked them. Um, yes, the oil companies are hated in Nigeria till now. Mm. And um, they do all kinds of terrible things, and they cohort with the government and with the elders of the different communities where they operate, which was the reason why Ken Sarawiwa thought that the answer to the problem was to kill off the elders so that um, they can make an example. Unfortunately, other communities in the oil producing side of the Niger Delta took that to be a precedent and went on killing as a, a, a show of activism to um, bring some development to their communities. And this went on until eventually someone from the Niger Delta became president of the country, who still is president of the country, and there has been calm in the Niger Delta since he took over. Now, we don't know what's going to happen when he leaves, but for now, there's calm in the Niger Delta. So that was what uh, happened in the Ken Sarawiwa case, and that was how we got attention. But of course, 
also, the American government, their foreign policy was so geared towards uh, ending dictatorship at that time, and they supported a lot of Nigerian activists, and a lot of the media were fighting the dictator at that time. And I remember our Nobel laureate, um, okay, Walesha Yinka. That, that's terrific, but I bet other people want to ask questions, so carry on. Yeah, so please um, be careful not Thank to uh, edit history. It's, it's not right, so that the Thank younger you. generation would know what the truth is. Thank you. Did you want to comment or should well, we Well, yeah, I mean, I think you certainly are correct that there were the killings mm -hmm. of the, these uh, Agoni elders. And um, <clears throat> I do think that um, Sarah Wiwa was heroized, made into a kind of saint mm -hmm. uh, in the way that the, um, well, in, in the way the international media portrayed this, particularly in the wake of his execution. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know enough about what went on on the ground to comment on whether or not he was responsible. Mm -hmm. Certainly the trial, which uh, you, you mentioned yourself, uh, was really kind of a kangaroo court. And um, so I, I think that um, this kind of complexity that you're talking about uh, is, is very commonly the case in the uh, issues that we hear about in a much more uh, simplified version at the international level. Mm -hmm. I do talk a little bit about that in the book that I wrote, um, but um, I think that the, the point for us here is that that kind of um, simplifying of the stories is uh, you know, sort of one of the ways in which international tension actually does happen. Um, and as I suggested previously, mm -hmm. the um, complexities regarding the ethnic interactions, uh, mm -hmm. the uh, belief by the Agoni that they were uh, not getting en enough representation, not getting enough oil revenues from the central government, is something that also has not, w didn't really become part of the story internationally. Uh, it was just um, focused on the conflict between Shell and the Agoni people. Yeah, I think you're speaking to a, um, something that has come up again and again in the book, which is in a way, because journalism is storytelling, a lot of elements get left out and a lot of nuance um, gets left out. So it's been interesting for me as I've taken the book around the world because when I go someplace, sometimes someone will pipe up and say, well, you know, that journalist wasn't you know, pure enough or that journalist did another story that was terrible or that journalist oversimplified. And sometimes <coughs> people get really kind of angry and emotional. You know, how, could they, how could you put them in the book? Um, so it's, it's, it's given me a lot of chances to kind of Think, think about that. Um, and often the point I, I'll make is, you, know, you may not like the work that newspaper did five years later, but you know what? Censorship isn't necessarily the answer. Um, and I think, yeah, I, I guess I'm also getting a sense of, in a way, how, um, how, how publications, how, efe how ephemeral they are. Sometimes. So you have a journalist who was fantastic on cause A, but 10 years later did a terrible job on cause B, or, or a publication that changed. Um, and that transition is also one of the things that I found about the book, which is that pretty much, you know, as we think about this, the importance of institutions and do we need st how do, you know, strong media, one of the surprising things about the book was that pretty much every newspaper and magazine that's in it that published incredible investigative reporting doesn't exist anymore. Um, and I thought you had to have strong institutions that lasted for the journalism to have an impact. But in many cases, the journalism endured even though the institutions didn't. So that, that's another point that, that we got from the research. Um, quickly, yeah? Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Nia Kwete. Um, I'm a foreign policy activist here mm -hmm. and um, ve very much a big fan of the media and of, of democracy. And I didn't even know that the book talked about uh, Africa that much until your presentation. I was born in Ghana and came mm -hmm. here to grad school. But um, I'm actually here to be a bit of a contrarian mm -hmm. because I think the media also, who, who polices the media? And as we sit here now, two things the media have done in this country that bothers me as an Africa activist is how Ebola was covered. Mm. Um, it's 
I think it was just appalling. Mm -hmm. And African kids have been beating up and other things. Then another minor story is um, the revolution in Burkina Faso recently. Mm -hmm. There's good comment on it, but it's tied to other African dictators, whereas my 30 years of activism here tells me that the U.S. actually supports all these African dictators, not just the U.S., mm -hmm. but uh, um, other countries too. But the U.S. does a lot, and I wish the press who actually tell the American people, look who we are supporting and look what it is doing here. So I was hoping maybe if somebody can do a book on where the media drops the ball. I mean, oh, I well, think your book is great. Guess what? There is a book about that. <laughs> um, I was just uh, giving a talk in London, and some of the professors I know at City University are about to do an updated version of the 1983 classic work on how Africa is framed. Since I do spend a fair bit of time looking at African media, um, I have to say that this is a comment I hear all the time, how wrong the Western press gets Africa. And um, Ebola, I think, <coughs> is very much um, on, on people's minds right now. But I actually do know two academics who are about to edit a collection of how the sort of West frames Africa, which again is a kind of perennial subject in journalism study circles. So I think your point is well taken. Yes. Mm. Uh, I think uh, science journalists are also appalled by how all has been covered. Mm. But science, uh, science journalists have been let go by practically every newspaper around yeah. uh, CNN got rid of their science unit. They have a doctor. But just because somebody's an MD doesn't mean they do a good job. Mm. And uh, there's been a huge misunderstanding. and. Uh, it's been his, uh, the hysteria that resulted is uh, disgraceful. <laughs> Thank you for that. Anyway. And I also wanted to make another mm -hmm. point, and that is when things get oversimplified in newspapers, mm -hmm. it is often because whoever is editing that story says we've got X number of inches and no more, or uh, this is too complicated and I'm going to change it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the reporters are necessarily responsible for that kind of muddle. Mm -hmm. And I think this is one of the great things about the internet is there's infinite room so we can have more in-depth reporting if people have the attention spans to uh, sit through it and read. Did you, Katie, you looked like you wanted to yeah, comment. Yeah, um, I, I think, um, you know, I said about sort of the, the Wewa case and the Unical case how the journalism actually, we felt, helped our case and helped mm -hmm. um, engender a lot of activism around, um, around it, with whether it was shareholder or political or even forcing the company we felt to come to the table and talk to our clients. Um, but to your point, um, we had the opposite um, impact in another one of our cases against Chevron for um, human rights abuses, execution and killings of environmentalists in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. um, and we went to trial in San Francisco and it just so happened that our trial was um, during the Somali hostage, the Somali pirate. Um, you know, drama, which it was in the media, and um, and at the same time, you know, this was during a time when I think everyone was getting emails from people in Nigeria saying, you know, send me your bank account, and mm -hmm. um, and there was coverage of that in the media, and oh, Chevron's lawyers absolutely used that media hysteria around the Somali pirates to paint our Nigerian clients as pirates who were just there to steal from this poor oil company, Chevron, um, and hijack their, yeah, and, and it worked. It worked, the jury was absolutely like, yeah, they're all pirates. And oh it was unbelievable. We, we just were sitting there like, what just happened? Mm -hmm. um, so it can work the other way and I, I think particularly when it comes to Africa that's a phenomenon that we have to we have to take quite seriously so what what do the panelists think then now presumably with the internet you know everyone's connected it's it must be I mean are we now getting better I know we're getting faster information right and I say in the book you know, news travels faster now even if it's ignored when it arrives are we also getting better quality information to the fact that we can have instantaneous photographs um, and constant contact around the world? Are, are gonna, people going to be better informed, in your view? 
Jeff, you're shaking no, your head. No, I think it's, uh, you know, when there were three big networks and you got a story on the network, you, mm -hmm. you could just sit back and say, what, mm -hmm. millions and millions of people sat in their living rooms and over the next football game or whatever will mm -hmm. share, you know, what they saw and the guy will say, yeah, well, I saw that too, you know. Mm -hmm. That's vitally important. That's missing now. You don't have, and the resources that these networks could put into a story and develop the story and really nail it down, that is, that is huge loss for us. And uh, I disagree that, you know, there's just too much noise out there. There's too much information out there because there are good sites. I was very excited to see uh, CRI online, uh, mm -hmm. Center for Investigative Reporting mm -hmm. online, now has a, uh, an analyst, uh, impact analyst. This mm -hmm. is great. This is absolutely what we got to do because uh, these centers for investigative reporting have been proliferating, but okay, <laughs> maybe there's a, a glut. I mean, we, we have to take, take a step back and say, what has worked? You know, what have we done? What have we seen that's really worked? And one last thing is, is you know, we, we have to have some good news reporting as well because I want to give a shout out to USAID. I mentioned them earlier giving me a small human rights grant to minute, um, monitor compliance with the minimum wage in Indonesia. Well, they took some heat for that. The Nike rep in mm -hmm. Indonesia mm -hmm. called them up and said, what are you giving money to this guy who's, you know, we're getting hammered in the press mm -hmm. and, you know, it's, it's partly your fault. They gave me a grant just before I left Indonesia, gave my little institution a grant, 16 times the size of the original grant, just to mm -hmm. say to this company, <laughs> what they thought. And they really deserve to be applauded for that. You don't ever see good news stories about you know, what uh, an aid agency or a government agency has done, very rarely. You mm. know. Uh, so you know, what we did with that money was to interview workers. 160,000 factory workers in Indonesia That's were crazy. interviewed over, a, and, and this built up this pressure, because they were asked, did you get the minimum wage? Did you get the week after Ramadan off? Did you get, you know, uh, you know the bereavement leave or something? And these girls said, I had no idea. And, you know, they themselves took to the streets. Their agency is what brought change, you know, and that's what I think I, I may have kind of skipped over in my presentation. It was a number of strikes and the demands these workers were making mm. that really sealed the deal. Yeah. Cliff, Katie, any comments? I think one thing I want to say, oh, oh good, at least I was hoping that we'd hear from you. Maybe. I was going to call on you. Hi, Hi Alessia Tkacheva. Um, my question is about how the events like, in Ukraine are being covered and what the role that investigative journalism can play when uh, two states are practically unfolding this like propaganda campaign against each other. Thank you. Actually, I was hoping you were going to talk about Ukraine. I was going to ask you to, <laughs> what do you, <laughs> that you call it so closely? <laughs> Can you? Well, I mean, my I mean, question is more like about the uh, role that investigative journalism can play when it comes against the state rather than against the corporation. Because the mm -hmm. stories that we've been hearing is the uh, private actor is the target. Uh, but now we have um, the state, and uh, whether it makes, makes your role more difficult I'm not a journalist, of course, but I would certainly uh, say it's very, it's a difficult situation and one, you, you know, you certainly hope that uh, journalists uh, will probe and investigate the statements that are made by the two rival governments and their allies because I think uh, international, uh, internationally other states are taking one or another side and um, my own view is that often uh, journalists on certain beats will just kind of convey what the government spokesman is saying, even in democracies, rather than trying to critically analyze what's being said. And so, um, you know, I think there obviously there are many examples of journalists who do go beyond just the statements and not report them as fact. But uh, I think in this kind of um, almost, uh, you know. Interstate conflict, as you're, you're, you're saying, it's, it's particularly uh, important but difficult also to, to get to what's really happening on the ground because the different 
states are going to exercise real control over these areas. You may not be able to get in at all unless you're being uh, embedded in one way or another by, by the different uh, militaries or governments. So uh, it's, um, you know, it's a very difficult uh, situation. Okay, what are you I d definitely um, make it a point not to talk about things that I don't know what I'm talking about. So <laughs> Ukraine and that, that situation is, I mean, I know what I read in the media, but I, I will say that, um, you know, these days it's very hard in most situations to distinguish between the corporation and the state. Um, and so I do believe that, um, you know, any situation, there are going to be corporate actors, there are going to be financial actors, there will be government actors, and you really need to dig um, into all of it to find right. out what's really going on. Um, yeah. So I, I, just a couple comments to wrap up. I think that um, wartime is, all, is always sort of disastrous for journalism in, in, in many ways. I think that historically, again, I'm thinking about some of the coverage of the Boer War, obviously the Vietnam War, World War I. Um, clearly during wartime, I think the first, the Iraq War, the first instinct of the press is to rally to, to the government. Um, and I think that would be true pretty much. I mean, I'm trying to think of some exceptions. But so I think that you often get the sort of competing nationalist narratives, uh, no question. Um, again, the, the conflicts going on around the world now are extremely dangerous for journalists, um, especially the freelancers that are being sent out there are being used or just being hired you know, without any protection. Journalists who aren't even on assignment are getting killed. Um, Jill Simon talks about that, the fact that the internet has caused this disintermediation. People don't even need journalists to tell their story anymore, so they can just kill them. Um, so I think that's really terrible, and I'm not sure you, that's going to aggravate all the problems that, that we've just talked about. Um, I also want to, but I do want to end on a cheerful note, which <laughs> is that when you spend a couple of years reading journalism over the last 150 years, you realize how much great reporting is happening right now. Um, and it's astonishing to me. Um, I think when I look at the 19th century and I look at where we are today, there is, as Jeff pointed out, an abundance of fascinating, rich, marvelous reporting happening all over the world. Um, I think that it's also partly that we get used to getting our news in a certain way and how we like it to look changes. So to read the sort of turgid parliamentary analysis of the British newspapers of the 19th century doesn't even fit with our modern psyche, just as nowadays people like maps and visuals um, as well, much more than say before. So I think I, I can't speak to the future of journalism. Um, I don't know where the funding will necessarily come from, but I, I do want to say that reading lots and lots of old newspapers makes me feel, has made me feel very sort of cheerful about, about the coverage we're getting now, despite um, all, the, all the obstacles that we've also talked about. So thanks, everybody, for coming on may, this may horrible May I just point weather. out, I have a little Nike campaign scrapbook up here. It's oh, 20, 20, 30 pages long, if you're <laughs> interested. Mostly Fine. pictures, the visuals that are missing from the book, which I want to talk to oh, Anya yes. about having a study guide to accompany the book. I think journalism okay, props would really... I love it. And if we can sell 7,500 copies, we can go into a second printing. And then I want to put in, I'm getting all these ideas for people that should have been in this one. Um, yeah. So if everyone in the room could each buy 100 copies, <laughs> we'll get there. there for the second edition. Thanks, Thank everybody, you. on this horrible weather. Thank you. Thank you to the panelists, too.